Hey, welcome to the show. It's been a week since I've actually done the show. I've been um, focusing more on live streams at pro-abortion, you know, protests about, I think the, a couple of days ago, I did a, um, what's a couple days ago? I can't remember anymore. I've, I've actually done about roughly eight protests in the past two weeks, give or take. Um, and I talked a little bit about it about a week and a half ago. It took a lot out of me as far as like you know actual physicality because I haven't done that kind of physicality yet as far as like live streaming in real time. Well, not obviously real time, but uh, like outside, you know. So what that uh, that happened like actually the pretty much the same day as the overturning of Roe v. Wade, which was in itself a <sighs> you can see coming because the Democrats never freaking codified it. They like everything else, they use everything as a political weapon. I mean, they use wages, they use labor markets, they use economics, you name it, they use it to keep themselves in power. Now, the focal point of uh, modern monetary theory and the reason why I'm into it is because it's all about, you know, uh, educating people on how the on how the economy actually works. Um, you just have to look at every aspect of the economy, and yeah, and this stuff didn't actually come to promise for me until 2019 during the pandemic. So I was trying to figure out, you know, what, what uh, how money works, uh, how government funding works, stuff like that. I was, I was perplexed because I remember always hearing about how we're in a natural debt, but yet were able to give these corporations, you know, the Amazons, the Googles, the Microsofts, the, the Warren Buffetts, you know, those people, all the tax breaks that they can need. And I'm like, well, doesn't that mean that that takes out revenue? And if that takes out revenue, doesn't that add to, you know, the lack of spending that, that allows economics to keep going as far as it being a circle you know that sort of thing you know the environment you know that sort of thing and a lot of these corporate a lot of these industries are in the industry making money in spite of the uh, of the environment you know to th their bottom line is to make money no matter what the environment is like what what they're doing to the environment gas oil um Taking up where uh, you know uh, buying up the, those uh, government spaces to do more mining, you know, for whatever to pretty much you know uh, digging up in some cases literally the uh, the ground that we walk on, uh, heating up the environment through uh, fracking, you know, stuff like that. Um, so that's one of the reasons why I was look I was looking into funding, you know, and how it works and stuff like that. Then I. I think I looked. I looked up how money works somehow on on YouTube, and I think Stephanie Kelton came up, you know, on my screen. I, I've said this before, uh, and she was explaining how uh, deficits work. You know what deficits are. And I was remembering at that time. I was like, well, let's see. During my more formidable years, which was in the nineties, uh, born in seventy eight. So there you go. Um, in the nineties, I remember we actually had. A decent uh, economy, uh, you know, until late nineties. Uh, my father had a decent job. He worked for Seattle Indians of all tribes. Um, then all of a sudden, he loses his job, and we're I use Social Security as a infant. Um, at the time, I thought I had fetal alcohol syndrome disorder, like. Only up to about three, maybe four years ago, that that, that I find that I find out that I had uh, ASD, autism, uh, autism spectrum disorder. So I'm 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 not I'm autistic, um, which kind of goes, goes aside with my um, what do you call it? obsessions, you know, single uh, single obsessions like you know, wrestling and. Uh, uh, business of some kind, you know, I've always been uh, interested in business. Uh, anyways, I'm kind of off the rails here. Point being is that's when I started learning more about modern monetary theory. Uh, I was also a big Bernie person as far as that part goes, but then like after the second time he got he unquote, unquote screwed, um, I then find out that 
you know, he knew he, he wasn't going to get the nomination, I would think. Um, anyway, so the point being is, that's when I really got into modern monetary theory and started looking more and more of it up and stuff like that. Then I got into Green Party politics because they were because of Bernie got screw. So I was like, okay, well, who else is going to be running? You know, the, the Green Party. I once we moved uh, to Ohio, the first person I interviewed was Madeline Hoffman, uh, July 9th, actually. So it's a couple of days ago, but you know, happy anniversary, I suppose. Um, anyway, so two years now i suppose yeah two years um anyway uh so after that i i kept interviewing nothing but green party uh, members because nobody else would give me, give me the time of day for that anyway so my point being is okay uh, the point being here is i have learned a lot i have grown a lot not only as a person but as a broadcaster as a you know I guess content creator is is, is, no, is no way of saying it. Um, anyway, so I got into modern monetary theory. Uh, yeah, so th that's where I'm at now. And modern monetary theory has actually helped me immensely as far as learning how government works and funding. Uh, we have to spend before we tax, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, also through uh, Warren Mosler. Um, yeah, so that's my journey in a nutshell as far as Oprah goes. So anyway, so I've also been saying that uh, since the pandemic happened, um, I knew that shit was going to get real. Um, and I knew that uh, I can now see through the modern monetary theory lens, I guess you could say, uh, the uh, macro economics of uh, thing, not micro. Micro is more the well, kind of combination for me because anyway, I look at both sides as far as the part goes. And so there, I realize that I'm no longer a part of any kind of party. I am an independent socialist because I do think that workers should be in charge of the workplace. I think that workers are the reasons why the workplace flourishes, makes money, stuff like that. And a lot of times. Workers are the ones that have had the best ideas. The only difference between a worker and a boss is a boss has the control. That's it. Um, and a capitalist start the business off, but still, you need those hardworking workers to be productive. To in order for them to be productive, they have to make good money so that they can be productive and spend within the community. You know that sort of thing. We don't have that. We haven't had that since the eighties. Um, anyway, so. I've been saying for the past better part of a year and a half that uh, after COVID, because we are pretty much post COVID now, um, despite the fact a lot of people are still saying we're, you know, people are dying from COVID. Unfortunately, whether you get vaccinated or not, I don't really give a fuck anymore. I mean, as far as what the algorithm, what YouTube thinks, they can kiss my ass. I'm going to tell my truth. I'm going to tell the truth. That I, I'm going to tell the, the truth that I see. Either way, you're going to get COVID. A vaccine is not going to help in regards to that. It depends on what your overall health is. It depends on uh, if you have any lingering health issues that you just haven't either had the money for, insurance for, or whatever the case may be, maybe time to get it taken care of. Um, so that's, gonna not, that's not going to help you in regards to that. So that's just going to be a detriment uh, to your long-term health. Um, anyways, my point being is I started to see uh, what's been really the problem. A lot of the mainstream, uh, the, the, I'll just say mainstream idiots who, like the Peter Schiff's, who had to like take down his original, his, his business recently and go into metals again because he... This he did something illegal with regards to his his, uh, his bank apparently. Anyway, so he's no longer a part of that. Apparently, um, he's gone into precious metals. Um, anyway, point being is a lot of those people who are on the uh, the C uh, the CNBCs, the Bloomberg's, and all that, they're hedge funders. Either way, the only thing they do is they're managing funds. They're managing people's investments. So. Uh, and a lot of those are safe. They're, they're, a lot of those are uh, savings account anyway. Uh, it's not like uh, they're, you know, 
stockbrokers who are on the floor trying to like buy stocks for their bosses and all that other stuff. Those those more those are more corporate um, entities. You know, the Amazon, the world, the Microsoft, the world, that sort of thing. Um, so they buy and sell stocks on the floor, generally speaking, as far as I know of. Um, but the Peter Schiff's not the hedge funders. They manage money. They don't necessarily make money for their clients. They just they just make sure that the stocks are you know good as far as the money coming in. That that's pretty much all they do, as far as I could tell. So they have no real concept of how money actually works. They they're still on the backwards side of things. There are so many different things that Peter Schiff has said in and countless interviews that are contrary to what the economy really is. He keeps saying that inflation is based on money expansion. Well, that's one side of things. That's if you, uh, that's if you, if you, that's if you have to have too much money going into the economy, and not and not in that. Oh, and you and you have, it, it, yeah, it's, it that part doesn't make sense to me as, as I'm thinking about it. Because generally speaking, uh, it's still the same thing. It's a supply chain thing. If you don't have enough manufacturing to manufacture and produce uh, commodities to be able to sold, be sold, then yeah, those prices are going to go up. That's inflation. It's not from the spending side. Uh, it, you have to tax that money out. I mean, because I'm thinking about this, I'm like, well, that doesn't make any sense to me. It's like uh, too much money. Yeah, too much money, meaning there's not enough uh, manufacturing out there, which is a policy issue, not a spending issue. There's a big difference there. Anyway, my point on the matter is, uh, it's been a supply issue as is always a supply issue. Always. I mean, 1970s, the OPEC happened. Like all the Middle East co countries that uh, produced the oil got together. It's like, you know what? We're not going to, you're, you're helping this one country. We're, we're, we're not going to help you out as far as oil goes. So, because we are oil, because we are oil de dependent, we are now oil independent, technically speaking, because we are a, we are a gas and oil net exporter, meaning we, ha we have our own reserves. In fact, there was a, a news article uh, a couple days ago, uh, Mike Norman actually put it up uh, on his Twitter feed that stated that I think Reuters actually uh, found that uh, Trump, who was president at the time of which we started selling our reserves, which was supposed to be going on our on the on the national market here in the United States, not international market. Um, that was supposed to actually stay here and at least more of it should, uh, was supposed to stay here and help prices stay down. Instead, and I've shared the tweet that he, he, he asked, he asked uh, the OPEC people and, and, and uh, Putin to kind of go easy on the production because that will force the gas up. So anyway, my point being is don't vote for either party. If you want to register a vote, please do. Great. You have a choice. But we overall, we need a third party. We need multi-parties. We need you know people to show that they give a shit about you know being screwed, whether it be wages or not. Um, I also saw that there's a possibility that uh, Manchin and, and Biden, the two Joes, um, are finalizing a... Uh, a tax to now they say it's to uh, fund Medicare. That's not that's not how it works. They spend they have to spend the money first before they before they tax now. So that means that they would have to spend the money first in order for it to be allocated to those to those insurance um, programs like Medicare, you know, Medicaid, you know, so all that they have to spend it first. They can't they don't they don't tax anything. Um, anyway. That's what I got on that. And let's see. Yeah, I said from the very beginning, pretty much, it's going to be a supply chain issue because, well, a lot of, a lot of companies outsource their work, meaning they took their corporations and went overseas for a, for a lower cost and, uh, well, lower cost period as far as the part goes and lower export um, fees. 
because there was no sanctions at the time, as far as I know of, on the Chinas and, uh, and the Chinas of the world and the Canada of the world and Russia of the world and all this other stuff. So it was cheaper to produce stuff outside the country and still sell it at the same price to us. Uh, and that's what, what, that's what they did. That's how they gouged us in, internationally. Uh, and now, um, now they're doing it uh, nationally as far as being here. Kroger's, uh, you can look it up. Uh, Kroger's actually uh, has a, uh, had a, uh, a article out from 2021 that stated that it was going to raise prices uh, about 3%. That's because they were they were one of the mono, supply chain monopolies, meaning that they were that they had the inventory they already had. They're going to jack up the price, knowing that people would have to have no choice but to pay more uh, through food stamps or through United Healthcare, which is what, both of which is helping us, um, unfortunately. But that's the case. Um, and yeah, that's what happens as far as that part goes. Anyway, so let's see. Uh, this is this article is from da, 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 uh, is outlook for this year. Uh, manufacturing manufacturer operating in two complete re, uh, competing realities, with the exception of a few sectors. The industry overall is experiencing a resurgence. U.S. manufacturing is back and in a big way. Record-setting orders will. Uh, keep most sectors busy through 2023, and ongoing expansion is forecasted for at least the next 18 months. But in this era, higher demand is not necessarily translated to higher profits. Labor shortages and supply chain disruptions have created unpre unprecedented hurdles to fulfilling orders. Well, I said, as far as as far as the demand outpacing the production um if they would have kept those fucking manufacturing here in the united states in the first place our supply chain wouldn't be so damaged um in fact if obama had one codified Ro, Ro, uh, Ro, uh, if he would have codified abortion and made it law to land um then we would be having this fight as far as the bar goes uh <laughs> And they would have instituted a jobs program that would have not only um, constituted a wage increase uh, through the jobs program, because that would have created a competitive environment in the labor market. Uh, people would be stuck at 725 at the lowest and 15 at the at the highest and like maybe McDonald's and other places like that. I also said that when big when Congress left uh, left wages hikes up to uh, the McDonald's, the Kroger's, the other you know those people, uh, that they would hike it up to in order to entice people to work for them, but then they would drop it once the supply chain started going, and all of a sudden now we have like in tech, for instance, I think we had oh uh, quite a few um, layoffs, so. Uh, even though uh, jobs have the job um, job rate, uh, not job rate. I'm sorry. Uh, the um, oh, the, the oh shoot, what do you call that? The the news labor news. I, I suppose you can say uh, was was uh, was beyond their expectation. Doesn't mean that the underemployment, uh, the people who wish they had uh, full time good paying jobs, have more than one type of job and together have about the same as far as ways that they would have actually gotten if they had one good job. Anyway, so uh, let's get back to this. But the exception of a few sectors, have I read that? Uh, but in the era, okay, I read that too. Uh, supply chain disruption have created unprecedented hurdles to fulfill uh, orders. Those same challenges will continue to, to dog the industry in 2022. Small and middle market manufacturers will especially feel the pinch of rising costs for goods and wages, and a tax increase on the horizon is likely to put a chill on industry and reinvestment. I don't think it would be a tax on them, it would be a tax on other things, but not that. And it's not it's not to pay for anything, that's just to get that, that's just to get that money out of the out of circulation. So while it's a great time to be in manufacturing, it may not feel like it. The good news, manufacturers have a number of options to alleviate some of the pressure. Their best strategy is to dedicate the time and resources to preparing for the trends that will most affect them, affect their business in 2022. 
Uh, manufacturing industry outlook. Here's what, okay, that's da, da, da. okay. So, ongoing labor shortages. They're only labor shortages because of wage shortage. I've said this, I've been saying this for a freaking year and a half, two years. Uh, when there's someone, I mean, I think California uh, just passed a law saying that if you're an independent contractor, you can no longer be, and if you're smaller than 500, I think, or so, I'm not sure. Uh, point being is, you have to literally go back to a bigger business because those are the ones that those are the ones they're they're saying is hurting because a lot of them were shut down when the pandemic was here, which meaning that uh, those people had to literally do something else for work, Uber or a pizza driver or you know some of that something curbside as far as the bar goes or get into, you know, go to, you know, get into online uh, school, you know, those sort of things, in order to, you know, get better at something, in order to make more money at something. Um, but now, apparently, they're being told, uh, you got to quit this and go back to here, you know, that sort of thing. So, that's what's going on as far as California. So, I was like, okay, main problem here, wages. And that's been the main problem for, what, 40 years or something like that? The cost of living has gone up. Wages have not. There's your problem. Plus, again, more bigger corporations went overseas because it was cheaper to produce and cheaper for labor as far as that part goes. Now that we've had, now we've gone through a pandemic and supply chains have dis been disrupted, broken, whatever have you, um, they're now forced to come back here because, well, they can't get their product here fast enough, so they're losing money, I would suspect. So they come back here and invest some money, want some tax breaks from 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 uh, government, you know, uh, the intels, the whatever, pretty much, in order to be able to make, um, make uh, chips for computers, for cars, for cell phones, whatever. Uh, but apparently there's a hiccup in that too, because apparently Mitch McConnell, being a little bitch that he is, um, is threatening to stop the whole thing. They've already passed a $52 billion um, spending to to help those quote, 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 uh, businesses to open up shop here in Ohio and other places to make chips, to bring that manufacturer back. But Mitch being the bitch that he is, he's trying to stop that because I believe he thinks that, you know, they're going to take over again and they'll be able to hatch some sort of plan themselves. Now, I'm not a fan of either one. I, in fact, I kind of hate both of them, but until people actually get industries, not just for per abortion, which that is very important to, but also to make every state in the United States have open primaries, meaning multiple parties are able to participate and have uh, ranked choice paper ballots. I used to say ranked choice ballots, but someone someone had reminded me that, well, those machines can't be manipulated. Ballot and paper ballots, however, cannot, they can be lost, but they cannot be manipulated as far as the park goes. So that's why I'm advocating now for ranked choice paper ballots in every state, ranked, uh, open primaries in every state, just, to me, that's the only way I can see this actually being, being a, demo a democracy and not a two-party dictatorship. Um, now, a lot of people are going to say, well, UK has that, and they've, they've, they've kept, you know, uh, doing uh, conservatives, and the Labour Party is more like the Democrats. Yeah, they have multi-parties. Those parties' messages suck. That's the only difference. You know, and... Um, Green Party here, I I was a part of them to a certain degree, but then they came out in favor of vaccines. I'll just say vaccines, I'm not gonna say which ones. Um, that's where it broke me because when they said uh, mandatory, I was done. And I do think that it is hypocritical to for both parties to once Biden got into office, and I'm just it's a long one. Uh, once Biden got into office. All the Democrats were uh, were pro-choice as far as you know their body, their rules, and, and they're they're still like that in regards to abortion, but they weren't like that when it comes to vaccines. Republicans were pro-choice in regards to vaccines. Now they're pro-life. I'm like, okay, let's have some consistency here. Both need to be pro. 
pro pro choice pro, uh, pro uh, anti mandate you know that sort of thing pro choice period you can't just sit there and be pro choice on one thing then anti choice the other that's fucked up that shouldn't be happening that is hypocritical and that's why I hate both fucking parties because they're just going where the wind fucking blows when Biden and Kamala were on the campaign trail they were always saying. If it's a Trump vaccine, I'm not going to take it. Trump was defeated. Take the vaccine. What the hell? Stop with the fucking hypocritical bullshit. Anyway, that's... I was saying neither here nor there, but it's completely here that's there. So there you go. Anyway. I will be right back. Hey, welcome back. Um, do you remember when I said that uh, that I learned that uh, the United States is a um, is a gas and oil um, net exporter, meaning we send over reserves and stuff of that nature? Well, first of all, uh, I first learned that from people like Mike Norman, who talked about that. Uh, months ago, um, and gave out the uh, the EIA.gov uh, website to for people who wanted to, you know, you know, pretty much confirm what he was talking about. I did I did such a thing. I'm like, oh, that makes sense. Okay, then I got into contracts as far as like um, gas and oil contracts, leasings, and stuff of that nature. Um, then I started looking more and more about uh, about about gas overseas. Uh, uh, what country is the biggest uh, gas exporter? As of I want to say 2014, but I could be wrong about that. Uh, the United States is. Uh, we are. Uh, Canada is, and China is not China. I'm sorry. Uh, the OPEC country. I have to say that. Um, then. Uh, Mike Norman had, had mentioned that we, instead of keeping the reserves here to lower the gas, to lower the gas prices in, uh, here, uh, we send it and we send it overseas. And that's, you know, the foreign sector's benefits to, uh, to our detriment because they pay, um, I guess, less, I'm not sure as far as like per barrels of, per barrels of uh, oil, but in this in this story, the Reuters did a couple of, uh, a couple of days ago, to, up to a week ago. Um, let's see. Well, it, June fourteenth. So yeah, uh, last actually last month. <laughs> I just saw I just saw a couple of days ago. Anyway, so U.S. to sell up to forty five million barrels of oil from Missouri as part of a historic release. Now, if he now if but first of all, Trump actually started this. He started to sell our reserves overseas. So it's on him as far as up goes. But Biden had actually continued it. Uh, I mean, while that that's good for GDP, that's bad for us as far as like, you know, what we pay what we pay at the at the pump. Um, so anyway, the uh June 14th, the U.S. Department of Energy on Tuesday said it was selling up to 45 million barrels of oil from the Strategic Petroleum Reserves, or SPR, as part of the Biden administration's previously announced largest ever release from the stockpile. Deliveries of crude from SPR sale would take place from August 16th through September 30th, the Energy Department said. The Biden administration said in late March it would be it would reserve a uh, release, excuse me, a record one million barrels of oil per day of oil, uh, oil per day of oil for six months from SPR held in a series of hollowed uh, out salt uh, caverns, caverns, something that uh, caves basically uh, on the coast of Louisiana and Texas. Uh, see, the release was meant to help control oil prices that spiked after Russia, where the world's top petroleum producers in, uh, invaded Ukraine. They, they, they're taking back borders of Ukraine. Uh, after Russia, uh, Russia was uh, on the, as the West imposes sanctions on Moscow. 
Prices for global benchmark Brent crude have mar uh, marched higher since the March 31st announcement to, to trade above 120 a barrel. The rise has come as a few global oil producers have spare capacity while consumers emerging from pandemic uh, drive fuel demand. Biden administration officials have said that the oil price could be higher if the SPR had not been tapped, but the release has also driven the level of reserves to the lowest point since 87, adding to worries about tight global oil markets. <coughs> Oil markets, excuse me. Now, despite the United States having more in the stockpile than required under the international agreements, oil contract from previous SPR sale announced on May 24th was awarded to nine companies, including uh, Valera, ExxonMobil, and Marathon Petroleum, the Energy Department said. Okay, was that as far as I'm going to make? double check. I guess it was on that one, but there's another uh, story to be told here. Uh, this comes from today. Um, yeah, today. Uh, Joe Biden reportedly uh, sent 5 million barrels of oil to Europe and Asia in June, even as U.S. prices hit record highs. Uh, here are the energy stocks that could gain the most. Okay, so obviously about the uh, stock... Mm, Okay, I didn't read this yet, <laughs> at least not fully. Uh, one of the sure signs of inflation is the pain Americans are feeling at the pump. According to monitoring and seizure travel members, um, leisure, not seizure, uh, mem uh, membership giant AAA, uh, the average price of regular gas in the U.S. now sits at $4.752. Uh, <clears throat> roughly 51% higher than the 313 last year. Uh, President Joe Biden has been calling companies running gas stations to lower their prices, bring down the price you are charging at the pump to reflect the cost you're paying for the, uh, for the product. And do it now, he said in a tweet over the long weekend. The, uh, to combat rising energy prices, Biden administration is releasing about 1 million barrels a day from the strategic petroleum reserves. Through October, the flow had depleted the reserves to their lowest level since 86. But according to a recent Reuters report, which I just read out, the U.S. sent more than 5 million barrels of oil from SPR to Europe and Asia last month. Reuters reported that Phillips 66 shipped around 470,000 uh, barrels of crude oil from storage sites in Texas to Italy. Meanwhile, Atlantic uh, trading and marketing part of total energy exported two cargoes of 560,000 barrels. In fact, Wall Street sees material upside in the two companies just mentioned. Okay, so let's see. Phillips 66 is a diversified energy company with four operating segments. Midstream, uh, chemicals, refinery, and marketing and specialties. Headquartered in Houston, the company has 12 refineries in the U.S. and Europe with a global refinery capacity of 2.2 million barrels of crude per oil per day. It also markets gasoline, diesel, and aviation fuel through more than 7,500 7, independently owned outlets in 48 states. So basically the, the McDonald's of freaking gasoline. Uh, let's see. Phillips 66 returning cash to investors. The board has restarted the company's share repurchasing program, uh -huh, which had $2.5 billion remaining under its existing authorization uh, as of March 31st. The company also announced a 5% dividend increase in May at the current share price. Phillips 66 offers an annual dividend yield of 4.7% which is actually bigger than uh, the 30, uh, the, I think the 30 year uh, yield on uh, US treasuries right now is like 3.3 like three or something like that. Every stocks, uh, sorry, energy stocks has uh, have pulled back over the past month uh, and Phillips 66 was caught in the sell-off as well. 
However, the stock is up 60% year to date in star, uh, stark contrast to the broad market's double digit decline. Wells Fargo, and now I'm not going to. Well, as far as an idiot, forget about it. Anyway, point being here is if they would have kept it in the United States and sold it on this market instead of sending it around the world, uh, we our prices would has a better chance. And that's I'm not obviously I'm not saying that it would have been guaranteed, but it has a better chance of being down as far as pump prices. Um, as far as them listening to Biden, who knows? I mean. I remember back in the 70s, uh, apparently, uh, the president at that time, I'm not sure, it wasn't Carter. Carter was a little later on, I think. Uh, what's one of the presidents, I forget which one now, uh, got on TV and basically uh, said, hiring freeze, spending freeze, as far as, uh, as far as gas, oil, and overall hiring of people as far as upwork goes. Um, nothing as far as... Uh, well, uh, they said to, to oil companies, if you charge more right now, uh, we'll come after you. Uh, I, I guess uh, that meant that we're going to like take away whatever subsidies we, uh, they had in the first place, which worked because at that time, oil prices went down hard. So anyway, and they had nothing to do with interest rate heights. In fact, interest rate heights actually damaged the crap out of the economy. And... They pretty much did this time too. Um, even though the jobs report was way better than they expected, there's still a lot of layoffs as far as uh, as far as tech companies go. Anyway, that's pretty much what I got for the rest of the day. I wanted to talk about that. I've been wanting to talk about that for the last couple of days, but I haven't gone online and done it yet. Um, this is exactly why i mentioned my monetary theory because it makes me look at these things it makes you pay more of attention to the economy and not only at a micro level but at a macro level as well it makes me look at the reason why things are happening you know the patterns that are are in there and stuff like that uh, i mean if i had the freaking money um i i would definitely uh consider uh investing in in oil and all that because my my thought of that is i know that if you buy enough stocks in a company you can actually i mean uh, that is uh take uh buy enough stock to have voting power you can help change the direction of that corporation uh, i mean the whole reason why i say wwe uh the whole reason why they're not changing really changing direction really is because Mr. man owns 83 percent of the stock and the voting stock options there I mean, that's the reason why I, during the, was it the last protest I did? I think yeah, the last protest, I was talking about people trying to get together and actually buying more and more stocks of these companies to force change. Because unless, again, or like earlier I said, unless people like make sure that open, uh, the open primaries and ranked choice paper ballots are implemented in those, in every state in the night, in the, in the union, then nothing's going to change as far as politics go because you're still going to have the two party system. Uh, the third party is going to have to act so much like the other two parties that people are going to mistake them. And yeah, either way, votes are going to be lost. Um, you're going, you're no matter what, you're not, you're not, going, you're not going to be voting for the right party. I don't think uh, because the Green Party during, as I said earlier, during the pandemic, acted too much like the Democrats uh, after Joe Biden was, was elected. Uh, but they were actually acting with that before Joe Biden was elected, so they were they were kind of like ahead of their time in a way too, as far as like um, where Democrats eventually went. Um, remember how Hawkins was talking about uh, um, uh, was Trace and, and Trace and uh, something Trace and, and uh, Trace COVID uh, infections, uh, the vaccines and stuff of that nature mandatory. Um, yeah, I think it was a track and trace, I think, I think he was saying at that time, mandatory. So they were already pretty much on that on that in the first place. I didn't I didn't see it. I didn't realize it uh, until they started getting heavily, uh, until, the, until the government started heavily funding uh, these things as far as, far as mandatory uh, vaccinations. Um, 
anyway uh and yes again i'm not vaccinated we'll never get vaccinated regards to that part uh i've seen way too many reports about the spike protein and other things like that anyway again i don't care I, i'm not gonna get demonetized I'm, I, they don't pay me to do this so there you go uh and need be i'll do this on private thing anyway uh thanks for watching thanks for listening um hope you enjoy uh the uh the granny gamer 71 uh advertisement i have up um it's a great program ran by a great person um i'm very lucky to know her um anyway uh support real progressive support and uh learn mmt hashtag learn mmt uh support um real progressive.org support uh pretty much anything mmt wise that's actually mmt uh, support Granny Gamer 71. Uh, go watch on uh, twitch.tv slash uh, Granny Gamer 71. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Peace out for now.